I'd like to introduce our speaker. We are so thankful to have the magnificent Diane Bondi with us again to lead part three of this series. She is the author of numerous articles and two really fantastic yoga books, Yoga for Everyone and Yoga Where You Are. She's also a social justice activist, accessible yoga teacher, and the leader of the Yoga for All movement. Outside of teaching and speaking engagements, you can find Diane at yogaforalltraining.com and yogaforeveryone.tv. Thank you so much for being with us today. Diane, take it away. Nancy, I always think you sound like one of the reporters on NPR. You have that really smooth voice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hattie Cornish, and this is Fresh Air. You know, I just like... I need, I need a better name, though, then, than Nancy Patterson. Yeah. It, that doesn't fly. <laughs> Nancy Patterson here in Windsor is a uh, very prominent dance teacher, so... Um, your name, uh, your name has lots of meaning, so I just think that's uh, that's great. So your next job will be on NPR, I feel. <laughs> I, I'll, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Welcome, welcome back. Today we are going to start to tackle body image as it pertains to yoga, as it pertains to race as it pertains to personal power. So I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of an introduction to how we view body image so that we're all on the same page. I'm gonna open it up to discussion. So feel free to type into the chat when I pose a question or if you have a comment or you have something you wanna share. So over the past previous uh, presentations, we've looked at yoga and social justice and how that intersects with ethnicity, race, culture, you know, the eight limbs of yoga, how these things show up in our everyday life. And what I love about yoga philosophy and the actual practice of yoga, and when I'm talking about yoga, I'm not simply talking about the asana practice that we do on our mat, which is the, you know, colonialized version or the appropriated version that we practice here, where we put all of our focus on the poses and all of our focus on looking good in the poses. I'm talking about the entire experience of yoga. And I'm talking about um, making peace with our bodies, being able to see the light of others within ourselves and outside of ourselves, and being really conscious of what we're doing on the mat, whether we are teachers and whether or whether we are practitioners. And also, what are we learning in the yoga um, process, in the process of practicing yoga? And how are we taking that out into the world to make the world more equitable and just? I was just having a conversation with a social justice activist that um, is here in Ontario, and we both teach yoga. We have, uh, you know, very similar um, projects that we do together and we I have a podcast and we were it's called the intentional well-being podcast and we were talking about how do we define well-being how do we define body image how do we move through the world um, as black women and as yoga teachers like how do we present the information or the philosophy of yoga in a way that people can understand that this is not an individualistic practice right that yoga goes far beyond coming to your mat doing a few poses, which we call asana, and then just, you know, having this very singular or escapism moment, and then stepping back out in the world and not seeing the entirety of the world. So part of our practice, it talks about koshas, the layers of our being, and also talks about the veils that hide the truth from us. That depending on how we identify, and depending on where we are in the world, we can choose to see things, and we can choose to ignore things, and we can move through the world, mostly depending on your identity, largely being untouched by the struggles of others, right? We can live in neighborhoods where we don't see people who look different from us. We can be in rooms where our um, needs and our culture is constantly centered, and we can choose to remain in that very narrow focus of life. Or we can take a deep breath and we can step back and we can look around and we can say to ourselves, who am I not seeing in these spaces and why? If I'm a practitioner of yoga and I truly want to embody the philosophy of yoga, the eight limbs of yoga, and we talked about the first two limbs at the very first part and the second part of this uh, presentation, how am I going to embody what this practice teaches me and move out into the world to create a more equitable world for all of us? And I know right now the world is a very scary place. We're seeing a lot of unrest. We're seeing a lot of things bubble to the surface. And what I can honestly say about 
the pandemic or what it's taught me is I've seen things, I, I've known a lot of things to be true in my life, but I've actually seen these things played out in real time, right? Back in 2020, when um, George Floyd passed away, we saw things play out in real time because we were sheltered in place, a lot of us, and we were glued to our computer screens or our electronic devices, and we were watching the world because essentially we couldn't really be out in it. And lots of things changed for us. We kind of pulled back the veil of what we were used to, and we saw things in a wholly different way. We discovered who were truly essential workers, right? Who were the, on the front lines of this pandemic? Who were the most at risk in this pandemic? We learned that capitalism isn't fueled by billionaires, that it's actually fueled by us worker bees here doing all that we can do, and that people need to be held more accountable, and things need to be more just, and wages need to be different. And we learned a lot about humanity in the two years when we were kind of in a holding pattern, almost like um, two years of self-study, study a haya, if you, if you wish. But we had a, an opening and an awakening, and we needed to really define who we were as a people, define what it is that we stood for. We had to take a hard look at ourselves in some ways. And this was a lot of new information for folks, a lot of new learning for folks. And we're all trying to navigate this as we seem to be butting heads with people who think very differently from us and having different experiences. And I want us to be open to hearing all of it. I want us to be open to looking at all of the information. And as you are librarians, which I love, is that you're going to be excellent at doing research. So real real research, not just typing something into Google and having Google um, use the algorithm to, you know, fuel your echo chamber or to reinforce what you already believe. I know as librarians and people who value information and value um, good information that you have the power to really start to unpack and really start to educate people on what it is that we know about ourselves, what it is that is the truth, and what, are, what it is that we are conditioned to believe that defines us, right? And we're talking about redefining body image. And I was born in 1970, and I remember as a little girl growing up, all the TV shows that I saw on TV, and my favorite one in the 70s was Charlie's Angels. And for those of you who might not uh, have been born at that time, it was uh, three women who were detectives. They were private and guest investigators. And you probably have seen the spin-offs. They've done a few movies based on this 70s TV show. And the thing that always struck me about Charlie's Angels is we would watch this on TV, and then uh, you go to the playground, and you play Charlie's Angels, and I could never be the angel. I was always the bad guy because I didn't look like the angels. You know, there was no representation there. And when I was a little girl and I was watching TV, they used to have uh, Kool-Aid commercials. We don't have TV here. Everybody, you know, we have streaming services and everybody's either on Netflix or Hulu or whatever. So I don't, I'm not privy to a lot of the current advertisements, except for whatever comes up on Instagram, or I should say YouTube. But it was very clear to me when I was growing up as a young black girl that there wasn't a lot of representation of what I looked like. And my mother taught me how to notice tokenism in certain situations. Like, I remember one of the big commercials when I was a kid growing up was the Kool-Aid Man. And they would always, like, bust through this wall, and it'd be like, you know, Cool, this, this big red Kool-Aid jug would bust through this wall and then everybody would get a drink of Kool-Aid. And it was often one black kid. There would be like 20 white kids and one black kid. And my mother would say to me, what are you not seeing? She'd always want me to refine my vision so that when I look out in the world, what are we not seeing? And she would always talk to me about how important it is for us to make space for folks who look different from us, who, for folks who move in their bodies differently from us. Like anybody who wasn't centered as cis, heteronormative, able-bodied, young, and white, right? Because that was what was centered in my childhood. So when you grow up seeing folks that don't look like you in bodies that you will never be able to have because your bodies are just not built that way, you define your body image as being something that is not desirable, right? It is something that you don't see, and it makes it really hard to identify or to feel good about yourself if everything that you see or everything that is reflected back to you is not you. 
people who were centered in modern culture were, did not look like me. And if they were centered in modern culture, right, like shows like Good Times or um, I'm trying to think of some of the shows when I was growing up, were always focused on black folks' pain, right? People were either living in subsidized housing or, you know, there was always the, the story of the single mother who was struggling. It wasn't until, I want to say, the Cosby show, and I know that's a, um, <laughs> a very sensitive topic right now. I have no illusions about who Bill Cosby is. or um, Good times, thank you, good times. Yeah, we were always seeing this, this picture of what black family life looked like. And for whatever reasons, and I think it's very still very true to this day, is that TV and media likes to tell stories based in stereotypes. It's something that sells. It's something that gets perpetuated onto the screen. So when I was watching Good Times, watching Flo and JJ and Penny and all those characters, um, live their lives on screen, it didn't reflect my life at all. So I even grew and it didn't reflect the lives of the people, black folks that were in my family. It didn't reflect those lives. We, I had two parents growing up uh, at home. I grew up middle class. I, you know, had braces. I went to prom. Like, it was, it was a very different experience to watch that. And it was funny because almost a decade later in the 80s, we had the Cosby show. And I remember walking to school with my bestest friend in the whole world. We had known each other since she was two years old and I was 18 months. Our parents brought us together. Um, her dad used to call us sugar and spice and salt and pepper and all that kind of thing. So my very best friend growing up was a, was a, a white girl. And I could never explain. She, could, she would always point out to me, that can't be you because you don't look like that. And it really took a toll on what I believed about myself. So back to my story about the Huxtables. So when the Huxtables came to be on television, I remember having a conversation with her. I think we were maybe 12 or 13 at the time. I was obsessed with Denise Huxtable. She had such great style. It was somebody I tried to emulate. This was somebody that I finally saw that was close to my age that kind of look like me, share her experience on screen, and I felt seen for the first time in a very long time because I had parents who were professionals, right? And I just remember walking to school and my friend Stacy saying how this was not representative of black people's lives, that this TV show was some kind of fantasy because black folks don't live like this. And I thought it was very interesting that even though we were friends and she had been to my house and she had met my parents, my dad was an engineer, my mom was a nurse, she would say to me, like, you know, the Huxtables can't be a real family. And, you know, my dad's best friend was a professor at Howard University. And, like, I had, you know, I grew up seeing black folks being successful. I know that's not everybody's experience of, of being black. And I also want to reiterate that being black is not a monolith. There are many ways to be black the same way there are many ways to be other cultures and identities and genders. But we always narrow things down to a monolith or to a stereotype. And then that is often reinforced in our culture through television, through fashion magazines, through experiences that we have in the world. And it struck me as odd that people would see that the stereotype isn't real based on their friendship with me, but whatever they saw on TV had to be the cost. That there could be no way that a doctor and a lawyer who were both people of color, who were both African Americans, could be married and have children and live in a brownstone in Brooklyn. That, that was unheard of, right, in 1980-whatever, when the Cosby show was on. And so I think we buy into what society wants us to believe. And what yoga teaches us and being conscious teaches us is to pay attention to where the stereotypes we learned are not real. And the, a way to unpack this in our own brains is to see something other than what we are taught or believe, pay attention, which is where we lost, you know, that thread of thought as kids, pay attention to how we are being taught through our media literacy. What are we seeing? What are we not seeing? Who's invited? Who's not invited? So for the longest time, I'm going to ask you out here, you can uh, type it into the chat, and probably even to this day, if we're being 100% honest, what is the idealized body type? What is everybody aspiring to be? Because remember, body image is a trend, okay? It changes from 
decade to decade, from season to season, what's popular now might not be popular later, but there has been one underlying theme in my existence of being on the planet for uh, over 50 years around what body image looks like. Can anybody share to me what you believe to be based on your experience, right? Everything is based on our experience. What you believe body, what the idealized body is. Yes, I remember Twiggy, actually. I remember her. Yeah. Slender, white, young, able-bodied. Yes, cisgender, heteronormative, right? That's still, right? We're in, we're in the 21st century, and that's still what people are expected to live up to. So I'm very grateful that we're kind of done with the whole Victoria's Secret model thing. Um, Victoria's Secret fell from grace a couple years ago when they refused to allow plus size models to participate in the show. And when they did choose a plus size model, this plus size model was, you know, I think five foot ten, five foot ten in a size, I want to say twelve or something, which to me is not plus size or not plus size enough, if you will. Um, still pretty much um, focused on the ideal of what an idealized body type is, right? Like this idea of being tall and being thin. Because a size 12 on a 5 foot 10 person is going to look very different than a size 12 on a 5 foot 2 person like myself, right? So we are still seeing that perpetuated. And we see big brands like Victoria's Secrets lose their footing in the market, which I, I applaud because they also wouldn't let trans women participate in the Victoria's Secrets catalog or the Victoria's Secrets fashion show. So what I did when I was researching body image, because that is the body image that we all aspire to or we're expected to aspire to, um, what does it take to look like a person like that? And I just wanted to know, is that achievable for regular folks? We all know the answer is no, right? Because when I look at what is required to be a Victoria's Secret model, you can't be shorter than five foot ten. Uh, you have to have an at least a C cup to walk the show. Your waist can't be bigger than 24 inches. Your hips can't be bigger than 34 inches. Like there's a whole list of requirements for people to participate in this show. And just out of curiosity, how many people do you think in the world could, just based on their natural body, this is how they were born, this is how they come into work, what percentage of, um, for right now, um, the Victoria, um, Victoria's Secrets models have all been women. For right now, what percentage of folks, of women, do you think fit the category naturally? Like, the, you know, they were just born this way. What percentage of women do you think are 5 foot 10, um, have a 24 inch waist, have a C cup body size, have these long legs? What percentage of women just wake up like that? What do you think? Total guesses are cool. I'm just looking to see. Comments here. Less than 5%, 2%. Not, not a lot. <laughs> Thin, not athletic build. But yeah, I've seen that. I'm going to let you know it's less than 2%. Just like naturally occurring. Both your parents were Nordic skiers or whatever. They came together. They, re, re, they recreated what looks like them. Less than 2%. So Susan was really close at less than 5. So less than 2% of women can look like a Victoria's Secret model, yet that is the idealized standard for all women, whether regardless of how you identify. We create this unrealistic view of what a person is supposed to look like, and then we all spend millions, if not billions, of dollars trying to look like something that doesn't exist very often, right? That we, we take that 2%, less than 2% of these folks, and we make them fashion models. And we expect everybody to look like them. And if we don't, we sell them whatever we can to make them look like that, right? We sell them diets or exercise or clothes or waist trainers or whatever. And we continue to pick apart at people when we create something called body flaws, I just want to let everybody know there's no such thing. When I was growing up, I took a sewing course in high school, and we took we went to the Fashion um, Institute in Toronto, 
to learn about sewing. We went on a field trip. So if people wanted to, out of high school, apply to be in the, uh, go to the Fashion in Institute, we had an opportunity to go and, you know, um, check out the school. And I remember our teachers teaching us how to camouflage our body flaws in sewing class. So when you're getting this reinforcement that there is something wrong with your body, how are you ever supposed to feel good about yourself and how are you ever supposed to be feel powerful where you don't see yourself represented in the media, you don't see yourself represented in fashion, and then when you go to school uh, for education, you're getting that reinforcement from your teachers that certain body types are okay, certain people are okay, and everybody else is less than. That what is at the center of our humanity is one particular body type and everybody else is expected to live up to that body type. How are you ever supposed to feel powerful when, you know, you go to a school or you go to a store when you're in school and the largest size that is offered at a store is not, won't even fit you? How are we supposed to feel good in our bodies? How are we supposed to make peace with our bodies when we're constantly bombarded with the idea that our bodies are not good enough? That our bodies need changing, that our bodies need to be smaller, especially 50% of the population. We are always telling people that they need to make their bodies smaller based on bad information. Uh, Amy, the ideal body type is not powerful, it is, it is waif-like. It is something that we always want to keep pushing out there, that you have to be a certain size, that you have to be look a certain way. And that you can't be powerful within whatever body type that you are in. And that's just something that we need to push back against. We need to continue to call out. Although the body positive um, movement has gained a lot of traction over the past five or six years, it is slowly being co-opted from fat acceptance, which is where it started, right? In the late 60s, I believe it was 1969 that the fat acceptance movement started, saying that fat people were entitled to the same rights and the same respect as non-fat people. And so slowly over time, marketing got a hold of this idea of body positivity. And once again, it got shifted away from the folks who created this concept in order to demarginalize themselves, in order to be seen, in order to know that they were okay in bodies that they lived in, that, that their body was not constantly a project or something that needed to be fixed. And I think it's really important. I'm going to pause here for a second. There's a couple of different books I think would be really helpful if you're struggling with body image or you want to get a historic perspective of body image or you want to start unpacking your own ideas around your own body. So there's a couple of books that I think are really great. One book is by a good uh, a person I adore and fan, a fan girl over. Her name is Sonia Renee Taylor. Her book is The Body is Not an Apology. Okay, Sonia. Renee Taylor, The Body's Not an Apology. Uh, you can get it on audiobooks, which is a great way to listen to books. Uh, yeah, ama Nora Brown, amazing woman. I met her at the Eating Disorders Conference where we were both key keynote speakers. Um, and it blew, mind blown. She is incredible in person as she is on screen. And if you're not, if you're on Instagram, I highly recommend that you follow her. Um, she's also got a Patreon page. So I don't see her a lot on Instagram because folks who are sharing this work and doing this work are often shadow banned or um, being silenced online. So they've gone to paid platforms uh, in order to, you know, support the work that they're doing. So this is someone that I say buy their book. I think it's really important. Another book that's really wonderful, I think I have it on my shelf, is called The Body Keeps Score. That's another book that can be really helpful on your path. It might be on my other bookshelf out in the other room. There's only so many books I can fit on this bookshelf. But The Body Keeps Score. So it talks about our traumatic you know, experiences and how they're stored in the body. And how sometimes when we're working, moving through a movement practice like we did prior at the end of each session, how sometimes breaking up that energy that's stored in the body can help you move through that trauma, help you work through that trauma, or sometimes can activate you. Um, 
in terms of how you see your body. And I think my body journey and my body experience was completely changed by the yoga practice, which essentially said to me, you have this body, you can move it, and here's how, right? Often we are told we need to fix our body, our body needs to be smaller. And what I learned from my yoga practice through my own personal study um, is that my body is great as it is. It's the only vehicle I have to move through this experience we call life. So I need to really learn to trust it and have it trust me. And when I'm speaking about my body journey, I know that folks who are trans and a part of the trans community do not have that same relationship with their body. So that's a whole nother topic that I think can be better um, shared by somebody who is in a trans body to speak to their experience of moving through the world and having to come to uh, peace or coming to an understanding with their body. Um, right now, what I'd like to talk about is learning how we can either make peace with our bodies, come to a point of body neutrality, and find ways where we can learn to respect our body as it shows up and not constantly buy into the idea that we need to change it and it needs to look a certain way, that we can at, at, finally make peace and, and have that peace with our bodies so we can focus our attention on other things than trying to be perfect. Another great book, which is written by a friend of mine, Dr. Sabrina Strings, um, Fearing the Black Body. This is a really great book. Um, my friend wrote it. Uh, the very first time I met uh, Dr. Sabrina Spings, I was talking at the University of California at Berkeley, and they were doing a conference on race and yoga. And a couple years later, she wrote this book about the origins of fat phobia. And this will blow your mind about what you believe around body image and race. This is a great book to read if you're interested. It is a heavy read. It will take you a little time to digest it, but it gives you lots of opportunities to really contemplate what we believe about our bodies. And I had another one that just slipped into my head and uh, went away, but I won't think about it too much and hopefully it will come back. Other things that you can check out is also the Yoga and Body Image Coalition. Uh, we have three books, a trilogy of people sharing their stories of how they made peace with their bodies through the practice of yoga and through embracing the philosophy of yoga, not just practicing on their mat asana, but embracing um, embracing their, their bodies and moving their bodies in a way that was not punitive, which is often what we are taught to do with exercise. So one of the things when making peace with my body and feeling more empowered with my body was I also had to divorce the idea that exercise meant changing my body, that I was exercising because I was mad at my body or exercising was punitive and look for the joy of movement. And it was the yoga practice where I wasn't in competition with anybody else, that I could do what I needed to do in the moment that I could do it because I was very proactive in my own teaching of yoga, my own learning of yoga. And it was the only time in my life, and my friend Amber also talks about this, Amber, Car uh, Amber Carnes, uh, she's um, part of Body Positive Yoga, it was the only time in my life when I was in a movement practice where I wasn't in constant battle in my head about what my body looked like, what my body was doing, it like shut down that negative chat chatter that I would have during um, an exercise class. And so I shifted my focus in order to make peace with my body from the term exercise into joyful mindful movement or joyful intentional movement. Because sometimes intentional movement is not joyful. <laughs> and I'll give you an example. Um, heart disease runs rampant in my family. And for uh, women of African descent, we have a higher um, incidence of heart disease. And I have all kinds of um, theories and ideas on why that is. Uh, some of them proven, some of them yet to be proven. Um, so I thought to myself, I have heart disease that runs in my family as well. So I'm going to take it upon myself to take care of my heart so that I'm here for my children and that my body can help me move through life and live a better life. 
and hopefully not have to be on heart meds. And if I need to be on heart meds, I surrender that as well. But if I can hold off by, you know, getting a little bit of intentional movement, then that's what I'll do. And there can be something really powerful about moving your body intentionally. So I started a uh, running practice. I've been running on and off since 1994 um, or 95. And so I started back my running practice. And let me tell you, the first seven minutes of running is not joyful but it is intentional and i tell myself i'm doing this as an investment in myself later so uh, another thing that i took up because of bone density and taking care of my body as i get older is i um <laughs> i started lifting weights as a woman of an interesting age i started lifting weights and my goal is to be able to lift um, my overstuffed carry-on into the overhead compartment by myself without help. These are my goals. I keep them small and I keep them realistic. So that is my goal as I get older that I'm only taking a carry-on that's probably only gonna weigh 35 pounds, but I wanna be able to have the strength and the awareness to be able to lift that, um, oh, <laughs> that heavy bag in my overhead bin. So I start thinking about what intentional, joyful, mindful movement means. So for me, it means a little bit of yoga, intentional movement might be weight training, going for a walk, things that make me feel good without looking for or punishing my body or looking for a specific outcome or not counting, you know, steps or anything like that. I'm very conscious of just getting up and moving and moving for however long it feels good for me. So when people are learning to make peace with their bodies, I will often invite them to take on a, a yoga practice and I will ask them just to do 10 minutes. That we have this idea that a yoga practice has to be 90 minutes or an hour and it has to look like this or it has to look like that. It doesn't. It can be as little as 10 minutes. It can be as little as 20 minutes. And have that movement be a gift to myself. And to realize that the body that I inhabit is thousands of years of evolution and ancestry that has perfectly created a custom creation for me, that is like no other creation in the world. Even if you're a twin, you are not exactly the same as your twin human, right? So we want to start moving away from this idea that we are striving for some kind of perfection that doesn't exist. So learning to trust our bodies and redefining body image, we have to look at what body image is how cultural definitions of body image impact our self-esteem. And another thing that I've noticed, how race and equity impact body image. When you don't have access to certain resources, how does that change your body image? And I think that's important to look at and important to name when we're doing these things. So, um, of course, I put a bathing suit up here because that, I don't know, for a lot of people is a nemesis and, and, and strikes a lot of people to do things to their body um, out of a sense of being angry or trying to achieve something that is not possible. I like to tell everybody, put a bathing suit on and go to the beach. Go to the pool. Run around in the sprinkler, right? I remember the first time I uh, took my kids to a water park and I was feeling very self-conscious about putting on my bathing suit. My kids were little. They were like three and five. And I just remember my kids always saying to me, aren't you coming in the water with us? And I'd be like, no, I'm going to stay out here and take pictures. And I thought to myself, when I got the pictures back, because I actually printed out these pictures or made photo books with them, I was never in any of the photos. And I wanted to know 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when I look back at these pictures, where was mom? Right, Because now we have tripods and timers on our camera, so we can set up our phone and take a picture. And I thought to myself, I am missing out on life because I have bought in to a body image ideal that I can never live up to. It's an ideal that doesn't, I ask myself who it serves. When I am unhappy or uncomfortable or dissatisfied with my body, is this my original thought? And I always think to myself, I have never seen a two or three year old be upset with their chubby thighs. This is something that is a learned ideal, and it's something that we can unlearn. And I just thought of the book I wanted you all to read. Most of you probably already know it. It's The Hayes Book, Health at Every Size, by Dr. Lindo Bacon. The first 36 pages of that book changed my life with peer-reviewed evidence around why we want to stop dieting, 
why dieting is designed to fail, that it's a systemic problem that is designed to fail and blamed on the individual, and that creating healthy habits for ourselves out of a sense of self-worth are much better for our self-esteem and redefining our personal power than buying into the narrative that your body needs to be a project that you are constantly fixing. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Nora. So, changed my life, Nora. First 36 pages, mind blown. I met Dr. Lindo Bacon at the NETIC conference a different year then, than um, uh, Miss Sonia, uh, Miss Sonia, a different, and I had a moment, like I had a super fangirl moment where I had on a backpack with my presentation, and I just threw everything on the ground because she was sitting by herself, and I ran up to her, uh, I ran up to them, she was identifying it as Linda at the time, and I ran up to uh, Dr. Lindo and said, you changed my life, and I was spotting on them, and, and Lindo said to me, okay, I'm just a regular person that happened to have an experience. I go, but I don't know if you know the impact of your work. Like, if folks have really changed the way they move in the world. So body image um, is something that we create for ourselves. It's a combination of thoughts and feelings. It's, um, it has a scale. As much as I love my body, some days I'm feeling better about it than others. And I know that is normal, right? That some days you're like, I'm killing it. I feel really good about myself. I had a really good experience today. I had a good day, which impacts how I feel about my body. And then other times I'm not feeling so great about my body. So experiences at different times. It's like a sliding scale. Body image is influenced by internal personality and external are social events. But let's define this. It's not real. It's a feeling that shifts and changes, right? What are the four aspects of body image? We, um, the way we see our bodies is uh, perpetual. It's not always a correct representation of how we actually look, right? So we can have things like body dysmorphia where we look in the mirror and we see something other or we feel a certain way about our bodies that is different than what our bodies are actually doing or what they look like. Um, the way you feel about your body affects your body image, right? You can be happy with your body, you can be disappointed with your body, and these feelings will come up. And when I ask myself when these feelings come up, what else is going on in my life that has triggered this? Have I watched something that's, you know, activated me from a different time in my life? Um, for full disclosure, I suffered with an eating disorder for the better part of 25 years. And sometimes certain songs, certain smells, certain situations will bring back a memory for me and I'll get reactivated in that. And so I'll have to ask myself, what do I know about my body? What are some of the things that I can celebrate about my body? And as a person in a plus size body, one thing I always tell folks is that we are weightlifting all the time. So carrying your body around the world increases bone density. So people in plus size body often have greater bone density. Okay? I also say that if there was ever a famine, we are equipped to last longer than somebody who has a very fast metabolism. I also say that having a plus size body fills out your face, right? So you look youthful for longer. I always say that my lap is really full, so I have lots of places for puppies and kittens to sit. I can sit both my nephews on my lap because my lap is generous. And when I talk about my body in a way that makes me feel good, I call my body abundant. So I'm an abundant in the gift of gab. I'm abundant in my speech. Um, right now I'm not rocking abundant hair, but sometimes I have a lot of hair. And everything about me is abundant. So I often think that my body is a reflection of my abundance, right? So I get to choose how I see my body. And that way I'm less, I'm less, I guess, stressed out about it. And I also remember that my ideas around my body are going to change and that I don't beat myself up when I'm having a day that I feel some kind of way, right? Um, so I always try to engage my thoughts through my lens of yoga. What is it that my body means to me? For me, my body is an extension of my, design, my divine self. It helps me to navigate the world. It helps me to do this work. It helps me to show up. It has the capacity to love. 
It, you know what I mean? It motivates me. It moves me through the world. So when I'm having those body days where I'm not feeling powerful and I'm not feeling good about myself or I got caught up in social media or I got caught up in something somebody said and that it's pulled me into a place where I feel discouraged, disempowered, and unhappy, I try to remember the things about my body that I am grateful for. As an able-bodied person, I have no idea what it's like to move through the world with a disability. And when I took my training with Matthew Sanford in Minneapolis right before the pandemic, so I think it was October of 2019, I went to Minneapolis and I uh, took a teacher training uh, for Mind Body Solutions is the name of the organization. And Matthew Sanford is a, a Nyangar trained yoga teacher who happens to have paraplegia. So he was in a car accident as a child and damaged his spine. And so I had a whole new appreciation for body image in a body that the world deems as not desirable, right? So if you go through and you type in good bodies in a Google search, what do you think is gonna come up? Not folks with disabilities, not folks with uh, bigger bodies, it's going to be in a conventionally attractive body as seen by the ideal. And so I got a new appreciation for what it's like to move through the world with a disability, how much longer it takes us to get places, how much people treat you that even though you're in a, a, a wheelchair and you may have a physical disability or living with a physical disability, that people also think you are neurodivergent and talk to you like you're a child based on how your body presents. So body image is very, very political because it impacts the way people see us in the world. People make judgments about our bodies all the time. I remember the very first time I went into a public yoga class, for full disclosure, I've been practicing yoga on and off since I was three years old. So I've been on and off my mat for about 48 years. And I didn't actually step into a yoga studio space until 2008, I want to say, where I was in a studio space on the regular. I used to practice at community centers and in parks and mostly at home on my mat, but never in public spaces. And it wasn't until I stepped into these public spaces did I understand that yoga was being taught for a very able-bodied person, a very thin, a very flexible, a very cisgender, able-bodied person, and that we were losing the philosophy of yoga by focusing only on the asana, and the asana was being directed by diet culture, by fitness culture, that in order to be good at yoga, you had to be super performative. You had to be able to stand on your hands or stand on your heads or bend yourself into shapes that not all bodies do. And when I stepped into the space and I was judged for my postpartum body, I had had a baby six weeks before and I decided, my husband had said to me, you need to go and have some me time because I was starting to fray around the edges of, of being a, a new mom of two and my kids aren't even two years apart. So I was overwhelmed at the time. And my sense of wellness and well-being I thought could be restored by leaving the house and taking a yoga class and I was shamed for the body I showed up in. And so it reminded me that not all of us within the yoga space or within the wellness space fully understand what our commitment is to our students. To help them have an experience that helps them find themselves, right? To create a space where people feel welcome regardless of how they identify and regardless of the bodies they show up in. And so I had this really negative experience in a yoga studio space and had I not, already been practicing yoga for many, many years, that might have been the end of my yoga journey because I was made to feel like I didn't belong. Yeah, that's, and, and there's lots of ways that we can show up and give folks space to be who they are, but we have to create that space. And we have to tackle our own insecurities and our own ideas around what a good body looks like and what a not so good body looks like. We need to change the way we look at things. We need to move away from this ideal that there are good bodies and good bodies look like this and there are bad bodies and bad bodies look like this. Like this is this binary of what a body should look like in a yoga space or in a fitness space or to be beautiful or to be acceptable or to seek justice. That all starts with our own self-study of how we see our bodies and whether or not we're projecting that imagery onto others 
or we're buying into the narrative that society likes to sell us in order to get us to buy things, in order to conform to a particular body type, it's up to us to start to unpack what we believe about ourselves and our body image. And I think when we start to do that, we may even be able to unpack our own ideas around our bias, around ageism, things that we're not even aware that we are doing based on our own shame and feelings about our body. So these are things that, that I think about a lot. So the truth about body image, the fact that folks with proximity to systemic power to choose to represent and inject certain body in our psyches as the ideal is a legacy of white supremacy and colonization. And we already talked about what the idealized body looks like. So if you are not part of that particular demographic or that particular culture, then we we have our identities erased. And that's how I felt as a little kid. I didn't have language for it at the time because I was five or six. But when I look back on it as an adult, I'm like, I was erased from this whole Charlie's Angels. I never saw anybody that looked like me being a Charlie's Angel. And quite frankly, it was only until this most recent franchise or reboot of Charlie's Angels that we even saw uh, an angel of color as, as represented in that group. Even the movies from the 90s, um, I guess with the exception of Lucy Liu, she was part of that, but I would have liked to see an, a cast of three women who were from different, t different ethnicities and races representing the, t the entire, the entire, I guess, pool of, of folks that are out there in the world, entire humanity. Okay, um, so the proximity to all these ideas intend to erase our individual differences and make us conform to unrealistic standards so that the entire industry can then capitalize off of those constructed insecurities. There are no such thing as body flaws. I tried to explain this to my mother. She's 79, and uh, we were, she was up for the weekend. Here in Canada, we have a holiday in February. Um, called Family Day, and it's a Monday holiday, and it's a stat holiday. It was only created, I think, probably in the last eight years. Nobody really knows what to do with this particular holiday. So I took the long weekend. I invited my mother up, and we spent some time together. And what was really interesting to me is how hard she is on herself, still at 79. She's going to be 80 this year, that she could be so hard on herself about her body. And I keep saying to her, life is precious, and time is not infinite for these carbon-based bodies. Do I want to spend the entire rest of my life complaining about how I don't look like the front of a magazine and how I'm never going to fit into, you name it, whatever piece of clothing you want to be, how I will never do this or that because of the size of my body? Is that how I want to spend the rest of my life? I don't think so. I don't want to spend the rest of my life apologizing for my body. I don't want to spend the rest of my life you know, worrying about what I look like in certain clothing, unless my butt is hanging out or, you know, or I'm walking on toilet paper. Somebody please tell me about those things. But I don't want to be worried about the size of my jeans. And I don't want my, the contact of my, the content of my character or what I bring to the world be defined by the size of yoga pants or just regular pants, although I haven't been wearing those during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> I don't want them to define who I am in the world, right? And I'm speaking as a woman. I do not want that to define me. I want the work that I do in the world to define me, and this sh shouldn't matter. And to be clear, I have pretty privilege, right? So people who are attractive have greater access to all kinds of things, right? So I'm, I have to acknowledge that. I have to acknowledge, you know, that I have privilege because I'm, I can move through the world. I'm able-bodied. I tend to be hypermobile. These things are really valued in yoga spaces. I want that to change. I completely want that to change. I want us to see the humanity in people, and I want us to see the humanity in ourselves. And stop buying in, and I'm going to swear, I'm going to apologize, Nancy, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but I want us to stop buying in to the bullshit. To stop buying in. I also want us to stop measuring health by the BMI, because I call that the bullshit measuring index. It's not actually based in any kind of fact. When does dividing your height by your weight Give you, uh, give you any idea about your health, how far you can run, right? 
how you show up in the world, your mental health. That could not be determined by a scientific measurement. That wasn't even done by a scientist. Just saying. I'm not saying it, I'm just saying. So what do we do to re redefine our body image? Okay. We need to know why we believe the things we believe about our bodies, right? We need to know where that comes from. We need to unpack that. We need to work through it. Um, if we are dealing with disordered eating or eating disorders, we should reach out to somebody who can give us some treatment. We need to redefine how we want to show up in our bodies. We want to think about all the ways our bodies have been politicized. All the ways that we've experienced being other by lack of representation of similar bodies, acts of violence or injustice toward people in bodies that looks like yours, right? This is all linked back to that social justice. This is all linked back to our, our yoga, by our racism, by our sexism, by our heterosexism, our ableism, our ageism, our anti-fatness, our fear of being fat, as if being fat is the worst thing that could happen to you. And why is it that some bodies are going to get justice more than other bodies? How does that determine your body image when you see people of a different race do things that are similar to you and get rewarded for that behavior while you get punished for that behavior? When we look at body image in the modern world, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the Kardashians, how you can commodify things that come naturally to black women while black women are demonized for having big lips or big butts or whatever it, whatever it is we come to naturally. Holding up on a pedestal bodies that look a certain way and dismissing everybody else's lived experience in their body. So we need to unpack what we believe about our own bodies and rewrite our own stories. When we get on the yoga mat, let me see where I'm going here. Oops. When we get on the yoga mat, we are going to be um, doing a, an exercise called standing in your power, which is something that I really love to share and do to give you that whole feeling of powering up in your body and feeling comfortable in your body, especially in moments when you're feeling othered when you're feeling less than, when you're not having those great body image days. And this is a concept that was created by Dr. Amy Cuddy, uh, a researcher at Harvard University around standing in your power and being in your body. Okay. So I don't think I will share this particular video right. Well, maybe I will. I don't know if you can hear it. And Nancy, if I click on this, will you be, let me know if you can hear it. If you can't hear it, um, I've shared it in the resources, and you can watch it. Oh, okay. First of all, it's muted. So let's go ahead. Can you hear that? Not yet. <laughs> okay, now I'm just being yes. Um, yes. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead because I really enjoy this person. Because most people don't know the difference. And I kind of blame that on the companies who are using body positivity as a buzzword and not really understanding the origins of it and not really understanding the difference between body positivity and body confidence. Just a little warning that this video is going to be a bit more political than I actually am. So if that's not your cup of tea, click off. Um, I'm going to be talking about body positivity. So if that's not your cup of tea, then I kind of recommend stop being so salty. So before I begin, just a small disclaimer that I am not an expert. Um, as far as I am aware, everything I am saying is factually correct. And I do take the time to educate myself about both body positivity as a movement and body positivity as mindset. I do my best in that department. It does not mean I'm perfect and always right. So if I do say anything in this video that is incorrect, feel free to pull me out. Feel free to tell me I'm wrong. And I'm address that and put a disclaimer in the comment section if I am. But here is how I look at it. Body positivity is the political movement. Body confidence is something that an individual has. Body positivity is not just about the individual. Body confidence is. 
So you can look at a person and just from their appearance or from their perception or from their aura or their energy, you can say they are body confident. Still not 100% accurate. It's still not a great thing to do because perception is perception and what you're seeing is not necessarily what's in their mind. But you can do that. You cannot, however, look at a person's body and deem them to be body positive purely because they do not fit into your conventional standards of beauty. It is like saying just because someone's a female, they are a feminist. We're seeing this more and more where someone like Khloe Kardashian, who is curvier, will be written about in articles. And in these articles, they'll say she's so body positive because she's not hiding her body. That's an individual basis. So yes, she's body confident. She's not body positive though. If you've seen her most recent show, she's most certainly not body positive. Revenge Body, her new show, could be a whole separate video, but frankly, it could be a half an hour video, so I'm not even gonna touch that. But the point is, you can't call someone body positive unless they're inclusive of all races, genders, sexual orientations, ages, abilities, and also believe that all bodies are good bodies, and even more than that, do not promote diet culture. That is not to say that they can't believe in health and wellness and all of that, but to not... Okay, I'm done with it. Sorry, my phone was buzzing. Oh, no, I was I did. See, being body positive is not just about the mindset. It is also the political movement. Body positivity got started in the fat activism movement. So when you say you're an activist, not only do you need to promote that wherever you go, and not just on your social media, but in real life, you also need to educate yourself. You also need to be aware because people are then going to come to you as a resource for information. And you need to be able to provide that information, not just for other people, but also you need to have that information yourself if you're going to call yourself an activist. Now, this is just my point of view, but you can't be an activist if you aren't active in the movement. You can't be an activist if you don't defend someone or step in when you witness body shaming. You can't be an activist and still say that certain body types are unhealthy. If you are going to use the term body positive, you cannot pick and choose which body types you find acceptable because that is not body positive. In order to be body positive, you need to be intersectional. And intersectional means being inclusive of races, abilities, genders, sexual orientations, and all of that. I know this is a short video, but I just want to clarify that when you're using these two terms, it is important to make a difference. You can be body confident without being body positive, and you can be body positive without being body confident. And that means you can be insecure, but yet body positive, because you don't need to be confident in your own body in order to promote body love for all people. In fact, that's usually where a lot of people start. So that's the difference between those two terms. It's a bit more political than most of my videos, but as I said, I count myself an activist, and so I believe in education. So, education. I hope you guys enjoyed watching. If you did, give it a... So I thought that she made a brilliant point. I follow her on Instagram, right? So that we need to figure out how to feel comfortable in our bodies, have our own body confident, and to also understand that all bodies are good bodies. So I put together a few things from the Project Heal blog, who's talking about body image and social justice, around how we can start to unpack our own body image issues and make peace with our own bodies. So I love the idea that the body is your home. And often when I'm talking to young people or teenagers or adolescent folks who are now coming to a struggle with their body image, I talk about their bodies being their home, the place where their soul resides. I also talk about your body being a custom, a customized vehicle for you. Thousands of years of evolution and ancestry go to make up this perfect package that belongs to you. I also like this idea that your body is the longest relationship that you'll ever have, and it's going to require some maintenance. And we're going to have to learn to trust our bodies again. Because for a long time, we have been told through diet culture and media that we can't trust our bodies, right? And if we, I have a hard time with the idea of body love, especially if you are someone one who's in transition or born into the wrong body at birth. It's hard to learn to love your body. 
but can we start to accept what our body is? Can we start to work toward a place of body neutrality so that when you're walking by a mirror or you see a picture of yourself, the first place you that you go is like, oh, you know, that's a picture of me and I'm happy to be in that picture, as opposed to start picking apart the picture and looking for all the things that you think is undesirable or terrible about your body. So I like the idea of treating your body with respect. I always try to think to myself, would I talk to my five-year-old self the way I talk to myself now? So when you get down on yourself, and you get angry with yourself, is there an internal dialogue that is really rough, right? Because we are always our own worst critics. Is there a dialogue that you can change? Is this dialogue something you would say to your five-year-old self? One thing that I find is really difficult to teach in yoga classes as a yoga teacher is the aspect of listening to your body. So what does that listening to your body mean? Because we've been taught to ignore hunger cues. We've been taught to ignore um, tired cues. We've all been taught through capitalism to go, 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 produce, 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 produce. And, you know, only take rest when you are completely done everything else. So can we start listening to our bodies and noticing that we're tired and perhaps going to bed a little bit earlier? I am guilty of being on my phone far too long, so I've taken it upon myself to put my phone in another room. So at 9 o'clock, I go to bed at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Um, that is always my goal. I'm prioritizing sleep. I'm pr prioritizing sleep over work. I'm prioritizing sleep over watching TV or scrolling on my phone. I'm deciding in the 21st century that sleep is important to me and getting four hours of sleep a night does not help me move through the world, does not help me feel good about my body. I'm listening to hunger cues and I'm eating when I'm hungry. I'm not doing this, oh, we have breakfast at this time, we have lunch at this time. I eat what I feel like eating when I feel like eating. This is one that I think has been hard to unlearn, that we have this diet that we're supposed to be on. Um, I'm not doing that anymore. I've decided in my, 50th, um, my fifth decade on the planet, I'm not doing these things anymore. They haven't worked for me so far. So eating when I'm hungry, moving in ways that make me feel good, whether that's going for a walk outside. And did you know, I don't know if you know this, that getting up to two hours of fresh air, outdoor, time in nature has a positive effect on your mental health. As little as two hours a week, right? So can you go outside for 10 or 15 minutes? And remember, this learning to make peace with your body is not an all or nothing practice. It's an all or something practice. So if it means 10 minutes outside, if it means standing in your driveway, if it means walking around your block, if it means walking to your car, take that as an opportunity to move and feel good about yourself, right? Develop an, uh, an appreciation list, right? Be happy for the things that your body's body does. And I talked about this already, that I have a generous lap so I can sit both of my nephews on my lap. I have lots of room for puppies on my lap. You know, I feel really warm in my body. I start to think about all the things because we never talk about why, what's positive in a bigger body. We only focus on what's negative, right? And I like putting sticky notes on my mirror and on my wall. I actually took them down because I'm teaching with you all today, but I put up sticky notes to remind myself that these oppressive ideas were never mine to begin with, and I'm not going to perpetuate them. Okay, A self-care routine, and I know that self-care is a big buzzword right now, and people may think it's like going and getting a massage, or going and getting your nails done, or going and having a facial, which are really privileged ways of doing self-care, and they're not wrong. If you have that ability to do those things, I say go for it. I've been known to you know, have my nails done or, or whatever it is. But self-care can be saying no to things you don't want to do. Self-care can be doing a load of laundry because you need to take care of yourself. Self-care can be going to the grocery store. And if you can do these things with intention and mindfulness, they can be part of your mindfulness practice. Often when I go to the grocery store, which is my, one of my late, least favorite ta tasks, I reframe it as taking care of my body and myself 
Sometimes I'll uh, wear my headphones and put in a podcast while I'm grocery shopping or listen to music and make it a more enjoyable event. You know, small acts of kindness to myself, reminding myself that I need to drink more water. Speaking of rich, I have to get through this uh, jug of water before the end of the day. And for those of us who do not put our needs first and do not put ourselves first, I'd like you to put yourself at the top of your to-do list. Okay. Your self-care practice can be 10 minutes of quiet. Can be zoning out and daydreaming for 10 minutes as part of your meditation. Talking to yourself in a loving and kind way. Doing what needs to be done for yourself. Okay. Unfollowing media accounts that don't make you feel good about yourself. Okay. Social media can be really great for reinforcing the things we need to know and learning. I learn a lot on social media. But also unfollowing things that make you feel yuck about your body that don't allow, allow you to connect with your peace. Spending time with friends that you enjoy and love, that make you feel good, and maybe starting to weed your garden of the folks that don't help your mental health. And if some of those folks are family, which usually they can be, or I shouldn't say usually, they can be at times, is to limit your access to those folks. Spend less time if you are activated by those folks. And if you're dealing with disordered eating or eating disorders, seek out a professional that can help you redefine and reconnect with your body. We don't want to be separate from that. We don't want to spend our whole life living just here in our heads. We want to be able to live in our bodies. We want to be able to move through the world without judgment. Okay. So I'm going to pause here for a second and ask a few questions around how or some things that you can do in your everyday life to help promote a more positive body image. Because once you have a more positive body image, you will feel more powerful in your being. So if anybody wants to share with me some practical tips, things that you can do in your everyday that can help cultivate or redefined, redefine your body image. What can you start to do? What can you let go of? What can you pick up? I like that, Nancy. I'm going to see if I can open up the comments so I can see. Ooh, yeah. yeah, not making, uh, not making myself exercise after work. If I feel hundred percent, why do we push, right, Jamie? Why do we push? Yeah, why do we push when we don't feel good? Speak to yourself as you would a beloved friend or child or a pet. Absolutely, change the way in which you talk to yourself. Remember that the images that you're seeing on Instagram or media or television aren't real, right? That these are things that have been lit in a certain way and clothing has been picked a certain way and camera angles have been shot a certain way. You're not seeing what's actually there. What can we do? Be less stressed, uh, try to be less stressed and anxious. So coming to your breathing practice, Ellen might help with that. A little movement practice, that's a really great way to, yeah, to do doing any amount of yoga, walking, swimming, even, yes, yes, who wrote that? Uh, Lisa, again, I always say that it's not an all or nothing practice, it's an all or something. So even if it's three minutes, five minutes, I've rolled out my mat next to my bed, and I will just, when I step on my mat as I roll out of bed, I'll do two or three sun salutes, and that might be my practice for the rest of the day. Um, Make all you do inclusive, yeah, and work personal. Language matters, absolutely. Reframing the way you talk to yourself, reframing the way you talk to each, each other, figuring out what's important to you, 
all or something is yeah yeah I, it's really helped me as well it got me out of the mindset which is very much it has to be this it has to be hard you have to be dying none of that is necessary you can do things um, that just make you feel good for the sake of making you feel good um, I like your suggestion on positive yes I see I go to the uh, st the dollar store or staples and I buy these colorful sticky notes and I have them everywhere and I have and I buy a package of sharpies and I just write these things where I can see them so I have notes on the dashboard of my car I have notes on the mirror in my bathroom and my bedroom for things that I that reinforce that I'm okay that reinforce I get to be human that reinforce that I that Perfection is not a thing. That reinforced that me showing up the world exactly as I am is powerful. We need to learn that, right? It looks all kinds of different ways. Yeah, um, I like your suggestion of positive. I love that. Yep, get my journal note pack. Do you, you have to do for X amount of time where, so, yeah, all of that stuff is an old paradigm right it has to be a paradigm shift for ourselves so I want to do a little exercise because we've been sitting for a hot moment we're gonna get on the mat really shortly but before we get on the mat I just want to do this um, exercise here I wasn't planning on doing it here but I want to do it here now if it's available to you you can do this one of two ways you can come to standing if standing is uh, useful and helpful to you if standing is not available to you then seated and rooting down through your seat okay so if you if you are you if you want to stand you can stand if standing is not available I want you to push down through your seat instead so let's just do an, a quick exercise around standing in our power so I'm going to step back a bit so you can see all so I want you to take your feet about two fists width apart so just a gentle measure um, and if you're seated, taking your legs out a little wider so you take up a little bit more space, because that's the other thing we hear, like, be smaller, don't take up space, wait for your turn. We can set that aside for now. I want you, if it is all available to you, lift up all your toes, spread them out, and then plant them firmly down onto the mat. If you are seated, pressing down into your sit bone and gently curling the lower tips of the shoulder blades out the back. So that's what you're doing if you're seated perhaps resting your hands in your lap. If you are standing, I want you to push down into your feet and put your feet wide apart, like you're stretching the floor, wherever you are, the earth beneath you even wider. So you're trying to create space here. From here, I like to support my back, so I have a very um, sway back. So I want you to draw the core in. I want you to think of all your core values here. You can do this seated or standing. Place your hand on your belly and just draw Make your belly strong. Draw in so that you're supporting your back. And now if you can, bring the lower tips of the shoulder blades onto the heart, bringing the chin parallel to the floor, and think about lifting out of the crown of the head as you grow taller. Now relax your hands down by your sides, pressing down and wide into the feet. Notice what happens when you activate those muscles. And now take deep breaths in and out as you draw the lower tips of the shoulder blades. Press through the feet. Lengthen through the crown of the head. Lift the heart. Press down through the sit bones if you're seated. And take a full breath here. And just notice the power of your body wherever it is. Notice where you feel strong. Notice that standing and rooting or sitting and rooting feels powerful to you. So that at any time you're out in the world and you don't feel powerful, pause, take a minute, come to yourself and stand. And know that your experience is valid that you are valid and take a moment to breathe here and notice and you can do this anytime you're feeling less than and now on your next breath I just want you to shake it off a little bit shake it out because we've been holding that pose for a minute or so and as we come back to wherever we were prior to this exercise I want you to tell me if you feel comfortable to do so, how do you feel doing that? Did anything shift for you? What are your feelings around doing that? Did anything come up for you? Jamie, you felt more expansive than before. It's, it's interesting, right? Because we do spend a lot of time curled in on ourselves, especially when we're sitting down. But that expansion feels good. So I like this idea of making space and taking space. Take up space and don't apologize for it. 
You don't spend your time trying to fit in to a mold that was never yours to begin with. Yes, an opening and a grounding. I found it very grounded, and yet I feel taller. Yeah, yep. My goal in life was to be 5'5". Five five. I didn't quite make it, so I pretend. I usually stack my hair really small on my head. But yeah, it's good to open up your body, right? To feel bigger, to take up space. So I think that's super important. Thank you, everybody, for sharing that. All right. So what makes diversity in wellness so important? Right? Supporting, thank you, Amy, expansion, supporting equal access to health and well-being. So looking around the room and figuring out why, who's not here and why it's important that we all have access to, to um, well-being. Promoting unity as opposed to exclusion. So we always want to create spaces. And if we work in industries where we have any kind of power to diversify spaces, figuring out how we can do that. How are we going to use our powers of privilege? How are we going to practice our yoga of inclusion and equity through our workspaces in our everyday life? What are we going to take from the mat and the philosophy out into the world? Because essentially yoga, yoga gives us a guide to how we want to live our lives, right? Self-awareness makes us more interesting and is the ultimate catalyst to change. So knowing what we believe about our bodies, knowing what we believe about other cultures, okay? Knowing what we believe about our experiences, why we believe the things we believe about our experiences, and how we can apply that change to our whole world moving forward. How do I show up in the world for others and people who don't look like me in a way that's equitable, in a way where I'm not playing the savior, okay? In a way that I'm using my privilege or I'm sharing my privilege and giving a platform to folks who don't ordinarily have platforms, giving access to folks who might not have access to wellness spaces or feel safe in wellness spaces. How can I be an advocate? How can I be an ally? How can I use my powers for good, right? How can I leave an impact and a change? I first need to get to know myself. There's your yoga practice. I need to get involved in social justice. I can't just look and because it's not happening directly to me that it isn't important or that this isn't something that I need to participate in. I need to know that all the things that happen in the world are connected to my humanity as well. And I can make the change to participate and join humanity, or I can make the um, or I can make the decision to not be involved and not actually practice my yoga, not actually be here for change, and know that someone else's liberation, which is what we're doing in a yoga practice, is seeking liberation, is tied to mine. So I, I'm sure you've all heard the quote. Um, I'm going to paraphrase here: "No one is free until we're all free." That's 100% true. You can't walk through the world and feel free when you see someone suffering in front of you. And that's what yoga is asking us to do, to be aware, to make a change, to show up. And a lot of that has to happen with how we feel about ourselves and unpacking what we know about ourselves and stop buying into what other people expect from us in the ways we look, in the ways we show up, not spending our whole life as our body being a project. That this is our lives, and we get to enjoy our bodies any way we like to, and with anybody we want to, and that that's okay. All right. So how do we start thinking, uh, rethinking the wellness industrial complex, right? So we want to make sure that we're serving underserved populations or historically excluded populations. Okay, uh, if those of us want to be involved in yoga spaces or wellness spaces, finding the governing bodies of those spaces and figuring out how we can support trainings for new teachers. So we're looking at like Yoga Alliance, Kapalu, Yoga Journal, all those spaces that collect funds. I'm specifically looking at Yoga Alliance because they collect a lot of funds and creating, you know, um, scholarship spaces for folks. You know, incorporating yoga for all or accessible yoga models of accessibility for students with karma classes within homogeneous spaces and also in community-based spaces. And, and, you know, creating spaces that feel equitable so that we're giving people what they need. 
asking people how we can show up in community with them. Looking at opportunities, if you're a yoga teacher or if you're practicing, how you can support your studio or the space that you practice so that we can create more equitable opportunities for people who might be practicing with disabilities or people who otherwise don't feel safe in these spaces. How do we change, um, how do we change these spaces? Okay. Educate both mainstream and unique, uh, oh, sorry, disseminate information about training, scholarships, funding opportunities, um, who need it and who want it within diverse um, cultures and communities. So often I love the idea of um, sharing information with communities who might not have access to yoga and training folks within those communities who might want to teach, uh, might want to bring yoga back to underserved or historically excluded populations. So we might have the opportunity to train somebody within that population to take that wellness back to that population because we don't want to come in as not being part of that culture or part of that population and say we have something to share with folks. It might not be received as well as if somebody from within that community is trained and brings that back to their community as a point of wellness, as something they can do. And educating. Knowing where yoga comes from, knowing where traditional um, practices come from, indigenous practices come from, honoring those indigenous practices, not appropriating Indigenous practices. And taking care of our own wellness. Everything starts here first. What we believe about ourselves will often project onto others. So we need to unpack what it is we believe about ourselves. And take responsibility for our own learning and our own wellness because it will make you feel more powerful. Start redefining your body image separate from what society tells you the idealized body image is. Change your social inputs. If you're getting feedback that's making you feel bad about yourself or your body, change those inputs. Follow folks that reinforce what you need to hear in terms of making peace with your body. Start moving in a way that is not connected to changing your body. Move for the joy of movement. Whether you roller skate or you dance or you go for a walk or you go for a run or you get on your mat or you go for a swim or whatever movement makes your heart sing. It can be a big movement. It can be a small movement. It can be a little bit of time. It can be a lot of time. So I set aside time for myself. So I open a calendar and write down. So every morning in my calendar, because I get up pretty early, you should get up about 530 um, and I know that's a privilege to be able to get up at 5.30. My children are grown and I have that, I have that possibility. That I set out that time in the morning when the house is quiet to sit with myself, to do a little bit of meditation, maybe a couple sun salutations on my mat, and then move on with my day. Sometimes that's what it looks like. Other times it's staying in bed for that extra little bit of time. Sometimes it's the middle of the day oh, somebody canceled, I have, you know, 15 or 20 minutes between calls, can I jump on my mat, do a little bit of movement, do I have a time to take a lap around um, the block, especially if it's nice outside, I'm here in Canada and we're still in the throes of winter for another few weeks, so how can I create opportunities for myself to spend time with myself? Shut off your phone when you get a chance. Maybe set a time in the evening where it's like phone free and pick up a book. Find ways to reconnect with yourself separate from the constant influence and influx of imagery and information we get from everywhere all the time. Take a journey inward if that's available to you. Realize that you have worth. Do the things that make you happy because they will help you build your personal power. So I wanted to share some resources and reference with you. You are going to get the slideshow, so no worries. It will all be there for you. And I also think that 
Uh, you're also going to get a, a sheet with links on it that you can click the links. I know that's a lot easier than typing in all these uh, resources, but these are all the resources that I used to put together the slot, all 47 slides in the slide presentation. So um, you can check all of that out. And now I'm going to open the floor for questions and or comments and or concerns and or corrections and or whatever you want to tell me. So we'll take um, about five minutes for Q&A and then we'll jump on the mat. What do you say? Sounds good. And for those who need to leave at 3.30, I'll be sure to put the MLACE information in the, the box by then, the chat box. So we'll take a few minutes to um, check in with everybody. Oh, I'm so happy, Jamie. Thank you. Oh, that's the biggest compliment. I love that warm and fuzzy feeling. Thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate that. I apologize if you can hear my kids are now home. So I tell them, don't blast the stereo. But I'm hoping only I can hear it. All right. Any other questions and or comments and or concerns and or corrections? I tend to think supporting others in their movement and self-care is important as well. Absolutely. That, I think that's a, a great um, part of self-care as well, is giving, pay, giving folks the space to have their own movement practice and their own self-care. I think that's beautiful. Nora, I'm so inspired by your work as I dream up an inclusive and accessible yoga teaching practice. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nora. I'm actually doing with my friend of mine, um, Amber Carnes, we're doing a yoga for all live. I offer yoga teacher trainings for people to learn inclusion, equity, and accessibility. So I'm always excited to see folks want to be a part of um, of the of the world of accessibility and equitable yoga and wellness space that sees all of us. So thank you, Nora. We need more folks like you out in the world who want to share that and want to do the the work of creating these spaces. At first, believe it or not, at first it was hard to create these spaces. Not everybody was um, open, uh, and believe it or not, I got a lot of pushback in in yoga spaces around creating more equitable spaces, and uh, I was just determined. I was like, we can't just have yoga for one kind of person. Like, the space has to be available to anybody who seeks it out. And I'm glad to say that we have more teachers who are interested in providing accessibility than not. So it's, it's, it certainly has shifted in the last um, eight years that I've been teaching uh, the Yoga for All way of looking at yoga. How do we make this for everyone and for all folks? Okay, if there aren't any more questions and or concerns or comments, I thought we could take a five minute break. I'm gonna switch computers so we can meet back here. I have uh, 30 past the hour where I am. Okay. I am back, I think. I'm just hooking up my headphones. Make sure my headphones are hooked up and you can hear me. Okay, so let's go ahead and come to laying on our backs on our mat, placing our hands on our bellies. And if we feel safe to do so, closing our eyes. And I want you to take a few really deep breaths here. In through the nose, out through the nose. Or in through the nose, out through the mouth, if that feels a little bit more comfortable. So I want you to use the breath that feels best for you. So if you feel safe to close your eyes, close your eyes. And then I'm going to ask you to do something really bold. Hmm. Maybe something you haven't done before. I want you to place your hands on your belly or anywhere on your body that you've had a conflict with.
anywhere that you've criticized I want you to send it a little bit of respect. It doesn't have to be love, but respect. I want you, if at all possible, to make peace with that part of your body. I want you to breathe deeply and mindfully in that space. Take a few moments to just acknowledge that part of your body, to be in relationship with that part of your body. And if it feels good to offer healing in that part of the body. And then when you're ready, I invite you to float your arms up into T with your palms faced upward. And then one at a time, let's draw our knees into our chest. And rock, rock side to side. So if you want to put your hands on the top of your knees, that's fine. If you want to keep your arms out into T, that's fine as well. But just rocking back and forth, side to side. And letting your knees fall all the way over to one side, right or left, it makes no difference. Because we're going to do that second side, so I just want you to honor whatever side you're in. And then on the inhale, let's bring your knees back to center, and exhale, draw your knees over to the opposite side. Just let the knees rest on that opposite side, floating the arms out into pain. Just noticing sensation in the body. So when we say in yoga, listen to your body, we're noticing breath. Whether it's constricted or struggling, we're noticing sensation, whether it's painful or easeful, and we're adjusting that movement to accommodate the bodies that we are in. Let's inhale back through center. Exhale, plant your feet flat to the floor. Press down to your heels. You can bring your hands down by your sides. Gently tuck your shoulder blades underneath you. And on the inhale, lift the hips to the sky. And then on the exhale, lower down slowly. So if you want to keep your eyes closed as you move through this, you certainly can do that if it feels good. Then just lift and lower your hips. Pressing into the back of your head, noticing movement in the body. Taking your time, going as quickly or as slowly as you need to. Lowering down on that next one. Let's put our feet out as wide as the mat. Then I invite you to rock back and forth with those knees. So making sure that it feels comfortable in your body. And just rocking back and forth with the knees. Almost like windshield wipers. So you can put your feet out as wide as your mat, plant your feet and rock from side to side, breathing deeply and slowly. I'm turning on some lights here, so maybe you can see a little bit better. Just rocking back and forth deeply and slowly, mindfully. And then one more draw your and roll your favorite side, open yourself up. Sit up on my wall. I also recommend those of us in the body or with tight hips or maybe back. Whatever you need. 
and inhale are up to the side, all the way up. And on the exhale, and down arm over, taking the side. Inhale, come up. And then your right inhale, 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 and exhale, inhale, 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 Left hand. Back to center. Inhale to the side. And now exhale hold forward. Hips come to the floor. Put your chin chest. Check your arm. Beautiful. Inhale. Left And over to our hands and knees. So if you can pass your knees, your meditation cushion, blanket, or even your bowl underneath me. So a big tempo. You really can kneel on your toes, toes under. Take your hands slightly forward. Lift up from the belly. Take the gaze to the thigh. And exhale down. Penis to the chest. Lift it out. Inhale, stop. Coming back here to the position. Let's the back, arm forward, so it can be on the left the heel. Second step, right leg back, left arm. And cat cow, something to go down. Diane, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Your your microphone's really cutting out. Your cat cow. Can you hear me? You're pretty fuzzy. Don't hear me now. You just sounded a lot clearer. So sorry to interrupt your practice. That goes against goes against my my. Hmm. Sounds like you're talking. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I've changed out the microphone. Can you hear me, Nancy? Yes, much better. Okay, perfect. Much better, Diane. All right, perfect. Thank you. If you're still in cat cow, I'm going to invite you, if it feels good to do so, to press up and back into a downward facing dog. So the hips are pressing up and back, spreading the fingertips out nice and wide and pedaling the feet out. Now, if down dog is not your jam, you can sit your bottom back towards your hips and stretch your arms forward. 
into a puppy pose instead. Okay. Or coming into a downward facing dog pose if that works better. But choose your opportunity here. When you are ready, whether you're in tabletop or in downward facing dog or puppy, I'm going to have you walk your hands back towards your knees. Curl your toes under and let's make our way to a forward fold. Softening our knees, crown of the head comes down towards the floor. Lift and spread the toes. And when you're ready, pushing down into the feet, even if your hands are kind of just flowing. And inhale, reach your arms high to the sky, reach all the way up. Exhale, bend generously at the knees and fold forward. Inhale, half lift, hands come to the knees, the waist, or to the floor. Exhale and fold. Inhale, sweep your arms high to the sky. Reach all the way up. Exhale, hands through heart center. Now I'm going to invite you to step back with your right foot and take your feet out nice and wide. Face the front edge of your mat. And now turn your left toes out to the top of your mat. Bend into your left knee and circle your arms nice and wide. Or your two pose. Good. Turn your palms up to the sky. Inhale, straighten out through that left leg. Exhale, come back into warrior two pose. Inhale, sweep up. Exhale, warrior two. Two more times. Inhale, sweep up. Exhale, warrior two. One more time. Inhale, sweep up. Exhale, warrior two. Spread your fingertips out, relax your shoulders. Now bringing your hands to your waist, turn your toes to the long edge of your mat, circle your shoulder blades onto your back, and on the exhale, bend generously at the knees and fold forward. I'm gonna use my bolster as support for my hands. You can rest your elbows on your knees if this feels better, or taking your fingertips all the way to the floor. Softening your knees, inhale, sweeping the arms high to the sky. Let's reach all the way up. Exhale, turn your right toes up to the back of your mat and pull your arms out into T. Turn the palms up to the sky. Inhale, reach up. Exhale, warrior two. Inhale, sweep up, stretch up. Exhale, warrior two. Two more times. Inhale. Exhale, one more time. Inhale, reach up, stretch up. Exhale, and warrior two. Hands on your waist. Turn your toes to the long edge of your mat. Circle your arms high to the sky. Exhale, and hinge at the hips. Fold forward. Soften your knees. Lift from the sitting bones. Inhale, half lift, look up. Exhale and fold. Look over at your left big toe and walk your fingertips around to the top of your mat, lowering your right knee down. Inhale, take a nice stretch up. Exhale, bring both hands to the inside of that left foot and slide it back behind you. Take a few cat cows here. Squeezing between the shoulder blades, rounding. And now, coming back to a flat back, walking your hands over to that left side, stepping your right foot to the top of your mat. Let's inhale, reach up, deep breath, stretch up. Exhale, release both hands down to the mat and step back into tabletop for cat-cow or come back to your downward facing dog, pedaling your feet out here, moving your head from side to side, stretching, pressing back through your heels, softening between your chest pushing the floor away from you. If you want to move through vinyasa here, forward to plank, lower down knees, chest, chin, roll through cobra, meet you to be back and down dog if you can, or you can hang out here and down dog as I'm doing, pedaling the feet, or coming back to tabletop position. Just moving the body one more time. If you want to move forward to plank, knees, chest, chin, you can. Lower down, you can also stay in cat-cow or down dog. 
And then everybody meet me back from tabletop position. From tabletop, I'm going to invite you to come to a seated pose. Soles of your feet together, knees wide. Bring your hands to the inside of your ankles. Gently press the knees open as you lean forward with the heart. Beautiful. Let's inhale, lift the head and the heart. Let's plant the feet and you can either roll to your side and come down onto your back or roll straight back. You can cross your right ankle over your left knee. Take your right hand towards your right thigh and gently press the thigh away as you stretch. Beautiful. Or you can draw that left knee into the chest and stretch the hip. Let's go ahead and find what works for you. Good. Exhale and release. Doing that second side, crossing the left ankle over the right knee, taking that left hand and gently pressing away if it feels comfortable to do so. And then on the exhale, you can draw that right knee into the chest as another option. So you can be either or. Remember, it's not an all or nothing. It's an all or something. And then exhale and release both feet flat to the floor. And now bring the soles of the feet together and the knees wide. Open the heart. Open the chest. Arms out nice and wide. Stretch out through the fingertips. And you can either stay here if it feels comfortable, or you can stretch opposite heels, or heels to the edges of your mat. You can also come to laying on your side if that feels a little, little more comfortable for savasana or onto your belly. If none of those feel comfortable for you, you certainly can come back to a seated posture. Perhaps closing your eyes or casting your gaze down toward the floor. And just taking a moment to scan your body, whatever position you're in. If you've taken seated, bring your fingertips together and tent your hands, resting your hands or your arms and your thighs, tucking your chin to your chest slightly. And just breathing here. If you're laying on your back, stretching out, taking a nice deep breath in through the nose, taking a deep breath either out through the mouth or out through the nose, whichever speaks to your heart. Just finding your breath. Inhaling and exhaling. Softening the space between your eyebrows, relaxing your jaw. And taking a moment to be in relationship with your body. Taking a moment to be thankful to your body for showing up in whatever capacity your body was able to show up for you today. It doesn't matter how big or small the movement is. Just think of this practice as a connection to your higher self. to your best self, to your most compassionate self, to your most benevolent self. And with each exhalation, let's go ahead and let go of things that no longer serve us, whether they're criticisms or stories that we tell about ourselves, 
or belief systems that no longer align with the person that we've become. Give yourself the opportunity to be connected to your breath, connected to your body in a way that shows appreciation for whatever it is your body does, day in and day out. When you're ready, you can wiggle your fingers and your toes. Perhaps roll your wrists and your ankles. If you want to remain in Shavasana for longer, then honor where you are. Take that moment for rest and reflection and be in your body. But if you're ready to move, then stretch the arms out overhead, flex the feet. Move in a way that feels good. And then one at a time, drawing each knee into the chest and giving yourself a hug. If you're seated, you can circle your torso in one direction and then the other. And then gently and mindfully making your way to seated if you're not already there. Then when you're ready, you can place your hands over your heart as a gesture of gratitude to yourself for making this opportunity a priority for you. And a gesture of gratitude from me to you for allowing me to share this space, to be in community with you, to share my experiences. And a huge thank you to all the teachers who have come before me to share this practice. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be connected to your body and your breath and the world in a way that is joyful and kind and loving and equitable. But most all, may you just be. Thank you everyone for joining me today. And extra special thank you to Nancy for allowing me this opportunity to share with you what I love. Diane, it's been such a pleasure, and I, I have been a huge admirer of yours for eons, so, uh, you know, I'm just so honored to have been able to work with you and to, to share you with more people. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, as promised, everyone, the MLACE information is in the uh, chat box, and uh, this is it. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Sadly, we're at the end of the series, but Diane has other things going on, and you know where to find her, hopefully. Yeah. Yes. For sure. <laughs> so reach out if you have questions. You can find me at my website, dianebondyyoga.com. Or if you follow me on Instagram, I spend far and away too much time there. So I'll <laughs> definitely be there too. So thank you to everyone for sharing these last three uh, weeks with me. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor. Thank you, Nancy, for your support and for platforming me here. I appreciate that. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Be well. Farewell. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>